begin. So welcome everyone to the Quasi Virtual Workshop on Data-Driven Hydrology Education. Um, so my name is Emily Clark. I'm the training coordinator at Quasi. This workshop was organized by Venkatesh Marwadi at, at Purdue University and Ben Ruddle at Arizona State University. So today we're going to hear from Venkatesh Marwad and Ben Ruddle, as well as James McNamara from Boise State University, um, about data and modeling-driven models for teaching hydrology. So just a quick couple of announcements before I hand it over to Venkatesh to tell you more about the virtual workshop series. Um, the virtual workshop will culminate in a virtual poster session on September 29th. So we're currently soliciting posters and abstracts. Um, if you have a tool that you for teaching hydrology that you'd like to share. So basically the virtual poster session um, works just like an in-person poster session, except it's online. You would create a poster, and we would upload it into our virtual meeting space. And then we'd set up virtual breakout groups for you to discuss your poster. So if you have a tool for teaching hydrology you'd like to share, it's a really great opportunity to um, you know, share your ideas and get some feedback from other people from you know, the comfort of your own home or workspace. Um, another announcement I'd like to make is there is an upcoming quasi-training workshop, um, the role of runoff and erosion on soil carbon stocks from soilscapes to landscapes. This is being led by Thanos Papanicolaou at Purdue University, um, or the course is at Purdue University. Thanos is at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, it's October 20th through 21st. And the, in the course, you would learn about the state-of-the-art instrumentation and measurements available for quantifying carbon dynamics in intensively managed landscapes, um, from the soil profile scale to the landscape scale. So if that's something you're interested in, we do have a limited number of student travel grants available to attend the workshop. Um, and you can find more information on the Quasi website um, right from the home page as well as www.quasi.org slash instrumentation training and workshops. As a reminder, the virtual workshop will continue next week at the same time, so next Tuesday, September 16th at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We'll hear from Stephen Margulis and Lori Hunning at the University of California, Los Angeles, who will discuss a coupled e-textbook and modular watershed model for hydrology education. So with that, Venkatesh, um, I will let you take it from there. Okay, so how do I share my screen? So there you go, you can share your screen right from this page. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. So I know all of us are busy with the beginning of the semester, so I really appreciate your time to, to attend this webinar. So the reason we are doing this is we are all researchers and educators, and we talk a lot about research at all the times, but we don't talk a whole lot about education. And we know that there are a lot of efforts ongoing within our community. So the goal of this workshop, and hopefully we will have more of these in future, is to show what we have been doing for hydrology education so others can also start doing some of this and 
eventually we can all share what we have and and make make learning hydrology more fun and easier so today i would like to talk about the projects that we have been working on so uh, my name is Venkatesh Mirwade i am i am a faculty member at Purdue University and together um, with Ben Ruddell and Jim McNamara, we will talk about data and modeling driven modules for teaching hydrology. So just a brief outline, we have three speakers on this webinar. So I will talk about the motivation goal and the cyber infrastructure that we have developed as a part of our project. And Jim McNamara, who is not really part of our project, but some of his work that he has done for, for these modules fit well with what we have been doing, so I asked him to join us today. And then Ben Ruddell will talk about the, the impact on students' learning of some of the modules that we have developed. So, Venkatesh, we, yes. uh, we can't see your screen yet, so... Oh, you cannot see your, my screen, sorry. Um, let's, um, can you hang up, can you stop sharing and try to share again? So well, how about this? Can you see it now? Uh, no, it's just a black screen. Oh, yep, oh, we got it. You see it. Sorry, yep. I thought you were seeing my screen. Okay, okay. this is my, this there is the go. slide <laughs> I was using, and so these are our three speakers. So this is where it starts, so you didn't lose much. So as we all know, so when we, think of hydrology today, we just don't think about hydrology cycles. We, there, there is a lot more to hydrology now. So what you have on this slide is an experimental watershed, uh, and you will hear more about this watershed from Jim later. And we have instrumentation uh, available on many of these research watersheds where we have been collecting data. So we have field data. We have data from satellite images. We have data from airborne uh, equipments, like you see LIDAR here. We have lots of weather stations and other field monitoring equipments. And with, with all this, we have a lot of data, and we are living in this age of big data today. Uh, but then when we teach hydrology, so we start with hydrologic cycle, which we can do very well on a blackboard. So you, what you see here is a, is a uh, picture of hydrologic, simple picture of hydrologic cycle on a blackboard, which is easy to draw and see what's happening. But then we also do a lot of these things on blackboard. So what you see here is not really hydrology, but some of the, the, the graphs that you see here are similar to what, you also, what we also do with the soil moisture characteristic curve and hydraulic conductivity and moisture content and so on. So, so what, what our vision with this project is to combine what we do in class using our traditional teaching with, with, with the data that we have, with the uh, instruments we have, and we combine all these into modules so we can, we can learn hydrology by not just looking at the blackboard, but by also using some of these data and tools. Now, when we talk about developing educational material by using this data and modeling-driven uh, activities, it's not easy. So many of us are familiar with one kind of data or one kind of modeling tool or one kind of computational tool. So when we try to, to use something else, it's not easy. So we, we are looking at a very steep learning curve when we are trying to get data and modeling into instruction. And then on top of that, it's not just the teaching that we do. We have to publish. We have to write proposals. And then again, we have to sit in all these committee meetings. So when you think about when I develop these modules or new instruction material, how does that compare when I publish something? So for example, if I publish something today, Five years from now, my, my citations my, may have gone up. If I write a proposal, I may have a better chance of funding, increasing my research productivity, and so on. So, so we are always trying to, to manage our time and resources. So it's not easy to develop these new modules uh, if we already have a curriculum that we are using to teach hydrology by using traditional approaches. So even if we try to do that, if I learn a technology or a modeling tool and try to include that, 
the technology is changing all the time. So what you see now is an interface that I used from NRCS in 2010 to get soil data. If I develop some material that shows students how to get this data in 2015, this is how the interface looks like. So what I developed in 2010 may not work in 2015. So same with getting rainfall data. This is how the NCDC interface looked like in 2010. And you can see it was much easier because they gave all the hints and steps to, to tell the users how to get the data. If I look at the same interface in 2015, it's different. And these days, they don't even call themselves as NCDC. It's something else. So this, even the interface that I'm showing you right now, it's, it's a little bit outdated. So as you can see, these interfaces and, and tools that we use, they change constantly over time, and we have to, to keep up with them. Now, not everything changes that drastically over time. Few things change very subtle over time, like this Google interface that you see. So you can still figure out how to use Google, even though it has changed a little bit over time. But many of our tools and interfaces that we use in hydrology, they don't change uh, like this. So even if I want to climb that steep technology curve, even if I do everything by myself, this is how I end up at the end, exhausted. And I, do I really want to do this again? The answer may be no. So the, the point here is that if you want to do something like this, it's not individual work, so as I listed here, it takes a village, so in our case, it takes a community to to accomplish this. So, so the statement that I'm showing you here is from Ben Ruddell, who says, development of data and modeling-driven material requires a group effort and a community cooperative process to, to keep up. So I may develop something today, and I may not have time to update it two years from now, but if we do this as a community, and if we come up with a process to keep it up, then it might work. And as he says, the process is the key to making this work. Uh, there was a survey done in 2010 through Quasi. So some of the things that I uh, mentioned here was echoed in that survey. So if you look, so this survey was responded by about 100 participants, and that's the sort of uh, quasi-membership we have, about 100-something universities involved. Um, so we asked them question about background, what do they teach, and if you look at the constraint, you will see that time commitment uh, is, is a major one. Steep learning curve is another one. Then, then there is lack of access to easily adoptable teaching material. So, so there is some teaching material available, but it may not be easily suitable to what we are doing. And also a lot of things that we do are also, if we want to do this data and modeling driven, this also has to be place-based. Uh, those of you who are interested in learning more about what we found in this survey and some of the things that we are proposed in our proposal is in this paper, there was a special, special is, issue on hydrology education in hydrology of earth systems and sciences in 2012. So our paper was there, and there are a few more other good papers in that, in that issue. So with that, the solution that we are proposing, and we are calling this a solution, and again, what you see on these slides is from Ben Ruddell. So we are, we are proposing that we, we atomize or modularize our learning content. So it can be swapped. Um, so if I develop something, if a small piece of that content changes, then we should be able to easily swap it without, without doing a major overall of what we have. If you want to do this, or if you want to start sharing what the content that we are going to develop, we need a standard template or metadata, you can think of that in terms of metadata. So whenever we develop something that we want other people to use, and we, if you want to maintain it, having metadata is important, and we need a template or a format of that metadata for, for the hydrology instruction material that we are going to create. And that metadata has to do with 
things like what's the objective of this, what kind of data that you need, what will be the format of input and output, and also importantly, what are the learning outcomes of, of a particular um, module. And in order to do this, we also need a cyber infrastructure. And we don't want a very complicated cyber infrastructure. So if we develop something complicated, people are not going to use it. So we, we need a simple cyber infrastructure that will let instructors to build their own curriculum material based on data and models, and then they should be able to share it with others so others can keep building on it, make changes over time, so one person doesn't have to do everything. And as I said, if we are going to use data from our own experimental watersheds or our own favorite watershed, it has to be place-based. Place -based. So if I develop something for a watershed in Indiana, if somebody wants to do the same thing in some other watershed, for example, in Boise, Idaho, so they should be able to easily adopt it adopt it without making uh, a lot of changes. And we have a lot of other resources also, and some of the these modules that will be developed can should be able to use what is available out there. So when I say modularize, I just want to give an example of what I mean by that. So I use applied hydro- You are no longer muted. ...and maze in my class. So what I list here is section 5.2, 5.5 and 7.4 from that book. So section 5.2 talks about stream flow hydrographs. So what do we really mean by that? So in a traditional blackboard style of teaching, I would just draw a hydrograph and say this is just a time series of stream flow values uh, uh, versus yeah, stream flow values. Um, so you have stream flow on y-axis and you have time on x-axis and you can show the peak and and time to peak and things like that. But in a data-driven environment, this could be students getting the time series data from somewhere. They plot the hydrograph, and then they can separate the base flow to look at the direct runoff and base flow. Then you could have them compute the direct runoff depth. You could also have them compare hydrographs. How does a hydrograph look like in an urban watershed versus a hydrograph in a rural watershed? Or they could look at how the hydrograph look at look like in different seasons and so on. So what I have done here is modularize this one section from a book into these different small modules, and all these small modules then form the stream flow hydrograph lesson or a unit. Similarly, we can do that for the SCS curve number method. So in a traditional classroom, you just write that equation, tell them, tell them how to get the curve number you have a and you use the current number to get the excess runoff uh, or excess rainfall depth. So in this environment, you could again have students get the time series of rainfall, uh, learn how to calculate current number, and then do some calculations in Excel to get uh, uh, excess rainfall. So I have these two lessons here that has these different small modules. Now, when I go to 7.4, which is unit hydrograph, again, to get the unit hydrograph, I need the direct runoff, I need excess rainfall, and then I use the convolution integral to get the direct runoff. Now, if you look at this third blue box, you will see that four of those modules will come from, from my earlier modules that I used for stream flow hydrograph and SCS method. So all I have to do is create this small uh, last module, which is about deriving unit hydrograph by using excess rainfall and direct runoff. So if I have things like this, people can start pulling together new lessons and new units based on what's available in the system. So one could say, well, separate base flow, that's a broad topic. You could separate base flow by different methods. So somebody can say, well, if that is the case, I can have these different modules that shows how to separate base flow by using different methods, straight line method, variable slope method, recession method, and so on. So, so we can define what kind of granularity we want in, in the learning material that we develop. So this is just a conceptual diagram of what I uh, 
said, so we are going to have modules um, that can exchange inputs and outputs between each other, and each module has a standard format or template that you see here. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the cyber infrastructure that we have developed, and this work was funded by NSF, and I have given the award number here in case if you are interested to know more about the project. So I'm going to switch from PowerPoint to to my web browser. So this is the the interface that we have. The first page talks about the project, and this is the figure I showed you. And if you look at the left and right, uh, there is a list of units. So we are calling each module as a step. So for example, base flow separation using recession method. So that's a step. And each step has the same format. So we start with introduction. We talk about the conceptual learning outcome. We talk about practical learning outcome. How much time does a student need? Are there any reference documents that the students need to read in order to finish this? What kind of input do the student need to complete this step? What will be the output? And what is the required hardware and software? And then there are related steps. So for example, this step is up. <coughs> This step is about base flow separation. So in order to do that, somebody may also have to get the stream flow. So even though we are providing the input here, but if you want to do this for some other gauging station, you could use these related steps to figure out how to get the data for a different gauging station, how to plot uh, the data in time series, and so on. So then finally, there is instruction where we talk about what base flow is and how to use this recession method. And then we show step-by-step -step instruction on how to do that in Excel. Um, now, someone can say, well, this is good. It shows how to get the base flow, but the science is not that strong, and which is fine. So you can take over this step and add more science to it, and it's ready for you. Um, so if I look at steps. So there are different steps available, and anyone can use these steps and combine these steps into a new unit. So we call that a unit here. So if I go to list of units, so right now we have only two units. So I will just click on this unit hydrograph unit. So a unit is a combination of multiple steps. Um, so what I have here is a unit, and a unit also has a standard template or a format. So again, we talk about the learning outcomes at the unit level, student time, reference documentation. And what you see here are just different steps that are provided in a sequence to complete this, this unit. So again, getting rainfall data, getting stream flow data, separating base flow, getting the excess rainfall, and then you derive the unit hydrograph, and then you apply that unit hydrograph. So right now, we have limited number of steps and units, uh, but anyone can contribute or create a new step or a unit. So what I will show you here is just a small demo. So if I want to create a new step, or if anybody on this in this uh, participating in this seminar is interested in contributing something based on what you have, it's very easy to do. So you just click on Contribute a Single Step, and it will basically provide you with a form. So you provide your title. So I will just say, um, I will give some title, getting data from quasi HIS. HIS. Then I fill in this all these other details and as i said it's just a form for you to get started even if i don't feel anything i can just say submit what that will do is it will create a page for me and i can then log in and i can then modify or so because i'm already logged in so let's say getting data from quasi his so i turn this submission into a page and this is where now I can start typing. So I click on the Edit tool here, and then it will let me populate this form. And once I fill that form, I say Submit, or I say I click on this link that says Make Live for the first time. 
So what happens in that case is I get an email. So I'm the administrator or manager of this, this site. So I get an email. I get to review what somebody has contributed, and then I approve, and then that site becomes live. So right now we are working with Quasi to sort of form a review panel or review board that will review what is being contributed, and they will give the, the green signal. So if I go to my manage, so for example, if I go to steps here, so right now we have only two steps, and I ask my student to contribute. A, I see only two units, and I ask my student to contribute a unit. So he created this unit, and right now it's sitting in my mailbox asking me to approve. So for now, I'll just make it live, and so make this update now. And if I go back, hopefully I will have that new unit added it did not so technically it will add a new unit here once i approve that so so this is what we have um, and 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 i hope that some of you will go through the units and steps we have and use them and even better contribute to what you have so with that, I'm going to pass on to Jim McNamara, who is going to talk about the modules that he used, and then we will I will come back and show how we have used his content and blended it blended it into what we have. So so the idea here is, if you already have something that uses data and modeling tools, we can we can incorporate that into our system, so other others can use it. So with that, I'm going to pass on the the screen to Jim. So how do I do this? Let's see. Did you see the stop sharing button? Yes. Oh, stop sharing button at the top of your screen. Yes. Stop sharing. Okay. Yes, there you go. So Jim, you can take it away. And Jim, are you on mute on your end? We don't hear you yet. Yes, I was. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> now, I'm sure I said something brilliant, but I can't remember now. Um, so can you confirm that you see a green watershed? Yes. OK, great. So much. All right, thank you, Venkatesh, for the introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, hopefully the 10 to 15 minutes of an independent effort with similar goals that um, was previously described, but just kind of my own efforts, and then uh, an attempt to connect to bigger and better things that you'll hear in a moment. So this is a photograph of Dry Creek that over the years we've turned into our own little uh, experimental watershed. It's in the foothills uh, adjacent to Boise, Idaho, or Boise State University. This is a shot looking out of our conference room window through the football field before they put bleachers at the end uh, up to the watershed up here, um, which is, so this picture here is just up on the hills here is our ski area up there. And what we've done is turn that watershed into a, a local experimental research watershed that for uh, nearly 20 years now conducted an extensive amount of research and compiled lots of different data sets. And we're thinking, well, we should use this for uh, some teaching. And so this is a, just a, uh, I'll quickly just talk about the watershed and our efforts to integrate the data into education. This is just a, a screenshot of our website, which uh, our data portal, which I'll show in a moment. Um, our, our goal for the watershed is to provide temporarily continuous and spatially distributed hydrometeorological and geographical data from point to watershed scales for researchers and educators. And we've had this for 15 years, but we never really did anything about the educators uh, until very recently. And that's uh, what I want to talk about now. Uh, so I'm going to switch to um, the uh, website here just to quickly show you what we have. And so oh, I forgot to get back to the website. Okay, this is our this is our website, and I'll show you a little bit later about how we're getting the data. But if we go to our data access page, 
This is our, our um, watershed map. Everybody has their own watershed shape. We have almost 30 data loggers out there now, which is essentially the accumulation of different independently funded projects where you can uh, go to a link, say our tree line site, and what we have are uh, static images of the real-time data. So this was downloaded. You can see, I love it when it, when it works, September 8th uh, at 11 o'clock. So recently downloaded recent day, recent week, recent month, or recent year. So these images are all our unclean, unprocessed, unprocessed raw data of everything being logged at that particular station, including battery voltage so we know when things fail. Uh, and then we take this, this data and occasionally, or uh, once a year, we go through and clean it up and store in basically flat files, so weather station data, stream data, soil data, all at this one particular site. So you can click on a, um, let's just go to weather data 2004. Uh, our files are, in this system, are just stored as flat files and CSV files that open up in Excel, all standardized um, columns and rows are all in the same location so they can be read into models. Standardized data with some clearly missing data values here and there. We also we also Oops. upload this information to the Quasi Water Data Center as well. So we have a redundant, redundant system there. Uh, so that information is you know, at oh, back to our data access, essentially distributed throughout the watershed. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that's what we've been doing for. Uh, all these years is collecting the data. Our data flow is generally, let's see, uh, there we go. So um, just a few photographs of the data collection, uh, meteorological stations, stream gauging stations, sap low sensors, soil pits, uh, flumes and weirs, and everything you can imagine. Uh, if we've got a grant to do it over the last uh, 18 or 19 years, we essentially never decommissioned a data logger. Projects never end. Uh, we just keep them running. All it takes to keep a project going is a new battery. And so we just, that's, we, we kind of inadvertently or just without thinking about it first built an experimental watershed. We had the data transmission systems, uh, 900 megahertz radios and repeaters and Pam Ashland hiking around the field downloading data when it, uh, when the transmission either doesn't work or can't work and then through to our processing, curation, and presentation to our website. Our, our data flows, the, the collection by electronic or manual means, lots of internal processing uh, to our, um, we were plugged into the quasi um, HIS, so our server received this information, had, then we have various ways to make it visible to the web and discoverable by whatever tools you want to create. So recently we've been creating tools to, for education. And so over the years, by studying this watershed, we've actually completed over 40 theses have been done in this watershed. All the data is organized, quotes, and archived. And a few years ago, you know, we ought to use this for teaching. Uh, and so um, it's because, you know, a student does a thesis and writes one, uh, maybe two papers on it, and the data goes away. And so we're trying to, our goal is to make the data available for education uh, and to improve some general problems in hydrologic education that we're all aware of. You know, we're a fragmented discipline between geology, civil engineering, biology, forestry. And many of the problems that we're trying to solve aren't really amenable to back of the chapter homework problems that the new, the digital era is solving. We can solve those problems now. But a big problem is that there's a lack of continuity in courses and degrees because hydrology is not really as mature as its own discipline yet. So we get fragments of hydrology and kind of made up problems in different courses without connectivity within courses and across degrees. So this was a problem that we're trying to solve. We think, you know, research watersheds, because of the long-term data, uh, we can help solve that problem. We can bring global concepts to our to our backyard. You know, Place-based research brings all that data together and offers the ability to build some continuity uh, in our education. So at Boise State, we're we're building degrees to do that. Where at the BS level, we have you know, emphases in hydrology, geophysics, and geology. We have an interdisciplinary degree in hydrologic science, 
and then uh, PhDs in geoscience and geophysics, all addressing various aspects of water that they're building here. Uh, and so what we wanted to do is use the research data, um, some common data, data sets to vertically and later, laterally integrate hydrologic concepts. So laterally within a course, uh, use common data sets. To, the precipitation stream flow data sets can be used uh, interactively and integrated to, to solve watershed water balance problems. So through a course, a student will see the same information but used in different ways. But then also in a degree, we use the, we wanted to be able to use the same module, say in a 200 level water in the West class, where we may just think about simple water balance and hydrologic units. But then those same data sets and even the same problems used in a um, senior or graduate level class where we're talking about more advanced concepts. And then perhaps in a, a modeling course, we, students can be modeling the same data sets that they've used in the descriptive sense earlier. So repeated exposure through a degree kind of builds familiarity uh, uh, and continuity across the, the degree. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, so, just, so we wanted to build some exercises with some design principles that in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over a little bit. Let me just show you what, where we're at. This is uh, in no means a, a complete product yet, but just where we're going. So back to the website here. On our Dry Creek website, if we go to um, educational resources, we've just started making these modules and putting them up on the web. Uh, so guided modules with specific instructions where the step-by-step -step instructions of how to interact with our data for the, on these various topics and then some other topics that are less inclined, uh, less well developed. So let's go, oh, I don't know, precipitation spatial average. So each module has a, an introduction page with some clearly stated learning objectives that we want the student to do. In this case, this is the classic problem of estimating the the spatial average precipitation given a few gauges. Uh, if you've had a hydrology class, you know about piece and polygons, isohyoidal methods, hypsometric functions, and that. Uh, some background. Uh, so this is textbook information on the, the theory behind the, uh, the technique. So there's a precipitation elevation relationship. Some background about um, then the whole hypsometric function. Uh, and ISO uh, piece and polygons. Each exercise has a, a essentially a textbook description of the problem. And then project instructions. And we opted to go with very step by step, do this, copy this data into that column. The idea was to minimize the learning of the uh, software and maximize the learning of the concepts. And so we go through and we can expand a, a step, you know, download historical data from the website from these sites. So each we have a project Excel file where each problem has kind of tables that are pretty that are designed to be populated. So a student's going to go to our lower weather gauge and copy data from the website, the data files I already showed you, into this um, the, web, the Excel files here to be used in the instruction. And if they do that, plots are automatically generated. Um, let's see. And so you can, we can just, I won't go through the details of that, but um, so each, each link is expanded. And again, we have to go very detailed because I don't want students to spend most of their time learning how to use Excel. Uh, I want the, the Excel and the software barriers broken down so that the learning is about the hydrology. So we go through step by step um, on how to compute the spatial average precipitation. And each one is, ends with some discussion questions. And the discussion questions, I don't have the link. I picked the wrong exercise. I don't have the link fully developed for this one yet, where we have discussion questions for whatever level of class the exercise is being used for. And then some specific exercises, uh, directions of what to turn in, summary tables, different plots that they have to make, and then always actually an evaluation of the module, which I'll talk about in a moment. And so, uh, so that's a, just all the exercises essentially look the same. Uh, and then we build connections between the exercises. For example, the watershed water balance exercise. 
has the same format, uh, but then there's some connections. You can do the water balance exercise independently with precip and stream flow data um, all integrated into the problem, or uh, you can for, do the precipitation problem here, do this, do the stream flow problem, and then use that information to do the water balance problem so that within a course, that's the kind of lateral integration throughout a course. Um, and then once again, the same problems can be used all the way up to, I use them in my PhD level courses as well, where the water balance here in a 200 level course might just be defining the problem, whereas in a graduate course we're using the same data, maybe in a Budito analysis context, something like that. And so, let's see, back to the PowerPoint. So those are the exercises. Um, this is a couple, at the end I think I showed you that we have an assessment, so we, we have some assessments on what are the how was the organization of the module, some assessments on the content, was it easy to follow, uh, some assessments on the outcomes, did, you know, did they feel like they learned something, and then some comments, and of course when you ask for comments you get all kinds of responses. For some reason we get these Latin things, I don't know why, why those show up. Uh, but for example we get um, things like need more, more instruction, uh, another person says too structured, I, I, I could have done this without learning any hydrology because it's two step by step. So now we're in the process of, after having used these for a couple of years, to think about um, you know, how do we improve them for um, excuse me, educating students. So the title was Lessons Learned, and so I kind of remember that title right before this, so I tried to quickly think of well, what are some of the lessons that we're learning from this. First, in an operational sense, the value of research data and real data out there in the field is immeasurable. And I just want to say, we have quite an extensive network, but one stream gauge in Google Maps, and then you have an experimental watershed, and you can start building from there, and over the course of 20 years, keep adding to it. Never commission, decommission a data logger. Keep them going. Uh, and then um, shared data, uh, as Becca Tesh mentioned, we're in this big data era, and the more we share our data like this and make it useful, we can start to uh, develop these exercise, exercises like this, um, and I want to—I don't want to leave this point saying we have a, so this is Pam Ashland, she is a full-time employee that runs the watershed, and um, the importance of research watersheds, the research is uh, obvious, but to education, um, these things can be very valuable, and this is just a plug that we need to keep getting support from our universities and our funding agencies to have full-time support for managing uh, networks like this. And on the educational sense, we found that having these um, the, the web-enabled data really enables active classroom learning. We can download the data in the room and work on these exercises in the classroom. Uh, just my personal observation is since I started doing this, it does really, instead of using made-up problems from textbooks from somewhere around the world, it brings these global issues local. The continuity within courses and degrees is real. Um, and the, the students I have in my senior class right now, we're doing the same, using the same data sets they saw two years ago. So we can start at a higher level when we're talking about in concepts like watersheds. And one thing about, if, if you've used research data in classrooms before, you've encountered, you know, no data sets are clean. Um, the the you know, data gaps and, and very structured uh, data processing tools are essential to, so that the learning is focused on hydrologic concepts rather than uh, data cleaning and uh, uh, tasks like that. Uh, I did a screenshot while Ben Katesh was talking. <laughs> this was his slide because I thought it explained my play right now. This has essentially been me turn, uh, and some colleagues here at Boise State turning these our extensive data set into modules, but I've been doing it on my own, so I thought oh, that's how I feel like. And I'm looking for the village um, to help get this into a more usable platform. So next steps for us are, well, I want to work with, a, I'm a professor, right? I'm not a real educator, uh, to really evaluate our assessment methods uh, and work with real cyber infrastructure systems to improve the integration. And um, next steps is always just keep it all running. So looking to better connect with the Quasi Water Data Center 
and also the system that uh, Bengatesh and Ben are developing in their data and model driven hydrology education. And with that, I'll turn it back over to, uh, I think Ben is next. Turn it back to me, Jim. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing and then whoever wants to can share their screen. Okay, so the village, let me just spend one minute before I have been talk. So the village is already coming to your help, Jim. So Great. what I wanted to show is, so my students already looked at your module, so he looked at the water balance. So if you look at these three, so calculating total annual depth of stream flow precipitation and water balance. So he has created all the steps that you have in your water balance model, and then we have a unit here for the annual water oh, nice. water balance. So, so, so the message here is that any instruction material that anybody has can be can be ingested into our modules, so other others can use it. So, with all this, the question obviously is: Is it really going to impact students' learning? And that's where Ben comes into picture. So he has done very extensive assessment of these teaching methods and what students and learn, have learned and things like that. So I'm going to have Ben talk a little bit about his work on students' learning. Ben, are you on the call? I'm on. Am I oh. muted? Yes. No, you're fine now. OK, great. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me and for the good introduction. So this uh, conclusion to this three-part seminar is going to look at some of the evaluation results from the use of this system in a, in a uh, community college geoscience classroom where they teach hydrology. This evaluation happened in Arizona at Chandler Gilbert Community College in, an, in a large group of multiple sections of lower division geoscience taught by Roy Schieser uh, here at that community college. <clears throat> Chris Sanchez, who's now at Oregon State University, has helped us with the experimental design. He's an educational expert. And this paper is currently under discussion in the review phase. It has discussions. So you can go and post a comment there if you want. We're in the process of revising it right now. And uh, this is the title. It's Enhancing the T-Shaped Learning Profile When Teaching Hydrology Using Data Modeling and Visualization Activities. So it's about what you would expect. We are trying to formally assess these learning outcomes and how they are improved when you change a, a type of lab material from a standard paper pencil exercise into uh, an exercise that uses data and modeling and rapid uh, real-time formative feedback through visualizations. So it's along the same theme as some of the other work that you've heard about recently. And there's a series of learning outcomes. Some of those are focused on conceptual learning outcomes, and some are focused on uh, the broader professional learning outcomes. You can hit the next slide, please. So it is a controlled study. Uh, control in the sense that we have several different sections of students, all, all, all drawn from the same pool at Chandler Gilbert Community College. Some of the sections are given a standard paper pencil exercise about rainfall runoff and urbanization effects on uh, flood processes. And the other group is given this uh, simple Microsoft Excel driven visualization model for the same processes. So one of them is not interactive and the other one is, and it has the visualizations built in, and the ability to use real data and plot that real data from a stream flow. Um, so that's the difference. Uh, what's the same as everything else? Uh, it's the same demographic of students, uh, same semesters. Uh, they're at the same educational levels. And they get the same lecture content. So they're told the same things in class about the physical causes of rainfall uh, and flooding about how urbanization and land use change affects these things. And so the only thing that's different is this uh, laboratory-based calculation exercise. So we've isolated that in the, in the controlled study. We use a pre and post quiz 
so that's to assess their learning deltas. So this, the methodology is based on looking at how their responses changed between pre and post, rather than looking at how uh, their absolute performance is on those learning outcomes. So this controls for differences in the populations. What we do is uh, so what, what we found is that the experimental group is scoring higher gains on both types of learning outcomes. That's the conceptual learning outcomes, these, uh, these concepts physically that underlie the hydrograph. But also we found that um, surprisingly students are exhibiting larger gains when they do this modeling and data driven learning exercise. They're, they have lar larger gains on the professional breadth outcomes as well. And the reason that's surprising is that we don't teach any of those professional breadth outcomes in the um, data and modeling driven exercise. And that is all taught during the lecture content, which is shared by both groups. And yet, the group with the computer uh, modeling exercise performs significantly higher on those learning outcomes. So we can we could debate why that might be, but that was a surprising finding of our research and why we named the paper what we did. Next slide, please. So this is a, just a snapshot of some of that content from the, the uh, online system. So we put this in the online system, and um, this is one of the basic steps we use. It's developing a rational method hydrograph model for the urban desert southwestern USA. So we we uh, have an Excel-driven modeling exercise for an urban watershed here in the Phoenix metro area where the students are located. So it's a place-based um, educational activity targeted specifically at their local area. And it follows all of these um, input and output requirements that are structured by the, the learning management system that Bankatesh introduced. Uh, next slide, please. This is a basic bit, uh, structure of this visualization. So um, you're going to, uh, based on punching in properties like the area of the watershed, its slope, its land cover, things like that, um, you get a rainfall event and you get this uh, simple triangle method hydrograph estimate. And uh, you also can draw on there the channel capacity that leads to flooding. And so as we change the, uh, so what, first thing we might do is just build the model and then we might calibrate it to match observed data, and then the students can change the land cover percentages, and they would then uh, watch these curves shift around, and you could you could see how a uh, changing land cover would contribute to um, flooding as you watch this hydrograph go up and up and up as imperviousness increases, for example. So it's an interactive system. But otherwise, the guts behind it, the content, are basically the same as the content you would see uh, from the paper pencil exercise, where they go through the same calculations. It just isn't visualized and it's not interactive. Next slide, please. So we're going to ask them these pre-post assessment questions, and there's a rubric. It's the way you would expect it to be set up. Um, one of the questions, for example, is for the students to identify uh, flood peaks and to draw different hydrographs a hydrograph that results in flooding, draw one that doesn't, and there are certain things that we examine, like to see uh, whether the peak of the hydrograph is above or below that um, stage line for the flooding scenario. And those are the basis of our scoring system. So we have two sets of questions. One is like that, it's based on the physical connection, and then the other is based on the agencies and the professional roles of hydrologists and water resource engineers who are involved in managing this process. So we ask questions about uh, what the students know and, and can recall about who is responsible for these things and why it matters. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of a scoring rubric for a randomly selected anonymous student. And it shows you those questions. So there's nine of them, and the last three are focused on agency roles, um, the value of being able to understand these processes, and the utility of having physically based flooding models for, for understanding flood processes. And then your first six are about the physical 
the physical issues involved in urbanization and flooding. Next slide, please. Here's the results. And without getting into the details, uh, the one you're going to want to focus on, the column to focus on, is the second from the right. That's that group effect size. And so uh, we're looking at differences um, between the experiment and control groups. That's established as this group of effect size. And uh, question four, we realized we didn't really assess very well, so we dropped it from our conclusions. And we, we didn't really didn't get any significant results. And, and the questions we asked were not effectively linked to the learning outcomes. That's reflected by a zero there in the group size. So uh, you at least know the, the assessment technique works because we found no effect on the question that we didn't really teach anything about um, for the physical effects. Um, in all the other learning outcomes, you have significant effects. Some of them are larger than others. Um, but some of the largest effects are actually in these roles and responsibilities of the various agencies involved, like the National Weather Service, the US Geological Survey, um, NOAA, et cetera, Army Corps. So um, without being taught anything different, the students who went through this modeling exercise scored significantly higher than the others on understanding what professional hydrologists actually do and why it matters. We thought that was very interesting. Um, why it might be, we can, you know, we can speculate about that. But it's reinforcing something, uh, clearly, it's reinforcing something that was taught during the lecture materials. And it's driving home some of the importance of this content. That is basically what I have to say. And I'll turn it back over to Venkatesh. Um, of course, I'll stay on to answer any questions. Yes, so I think we are open for questions. So once again, I want to thank everyone. So we sort of went little over time. So we have a few minutes for questions. So. so if you have a question, just feel free to go ahead and type it into the chat box. And I will read it back to the presenters. And they can answer it for you. So um, because the participant lines are muted, just type your questions into the chat box on your screen. A race to see who types faster between Ann yep. and <laughs> Who's going to win? Whoever presses enter first. Jessica wins. OK, so Jessica Lundquist says, uh, can you comment about the choice to use Excel instead of any other programming language? This is Jim. For me, it's because um, we're also doing a 200 level class. And just the visual aspect of Excel is just is probably biased, but I think easier. Uh, we are rewriting a lot of our exercises um, with MATLAB. We're providing additional MATLAB instructions for the more advanced classes. But our students in geosciences generally don't come uh, prepared with uh, those other, other uh, tools until later in their education. So I see one question from Ann Jefferson uh, that says, will, will we incorporate any existing modules from MOCA? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, it depends on, so MOCA modules are basically a set of presentations. So we have to look at which presentations align with, with, with some of the steps and units we have. So yes, we could. And those of you who have contributed modules or presentations to MOCA, if you want to contribute to our effort, just let me know what PowerPoint slides you prepared for, for sharing with MOCA. And we could include those in our modules. So. Then we'll cause it. There is another question from Ted. We'll cause the maintenance. Will quasi maintain a website to direct member towards these data-driven resources? Uh, we have spoken to Rick about this, and he has agreed to do that. So you will hear more from quasi about these in the future, hopefully in the near future. Yeah, 
And Emily, you are welcome to comment on that too. Yeah, I think this is something that is kind of actively being discussed at this point, and it is an area that we recognize that we can improve upon. So it, it's on the table and something that we're, we're thinking about, you know, how to, to improve. Yeah, then he also says the quasi link to MOCA is not really working. So that's something. <laughs> okay, I can, check, I can check that out. Thanks for pointing that out. So there is a concern about finding up-to-date or maintained resources from Quasi. Yeah, and like I said, I know that the, um, that's something that has been on our radar. Um, and so one of, one of our colleagues, um, Emily Deffling, is kind of more involved with that area of Quasi than I am. Um, and he's not on the line right now, but this, this is something that is going to be improved in the future, I believe. Are there any other questions? Okay, I don't see any typing coming in, but I do just want to remind everyone on the line so we do have another presentation in this series of the virtual workshop next Tuesday, September 16th at 3 o'clock p.m. And on behalf of all spe or three speakers today, I would like to thank everyone. So I think we had a very good turnout, and hopefully we will see you again uh, next Tuesday. Yeah, actually, there is a typo on this slide. I'm sorry. Tuesday is the 15th. So it'll be the 15th, not the 16th. Um, but yeah, thank you to our three presenters for kicking off the virtual workshop. And if anyone would like to submit a poster for the poster session, um, we are taking, um, we're accepting abstracts until the 15th. So feel free to contact me directly if that's anything you're interested in. I'll put my email in the chat box.